thank you. I hope you all stick around after the raffle. I've got no prizes on, on offer, uh, unfortunately, but I will be talking to you about automating CI CD workflows on AWS with GitHub Actions. So my name is Derek, developer advocate at AWS, and over the next 30 minutes, I'm gonna take you, as I always do, on a journey uh, through DevLand. I'm gonna start with explaining a few things about some of the services and features that you can use uh, with AWS and GitHub Actions. And like all my talks, there's gonna be code. I'm a developer, I'm not ashamed of that. Uh, so there'll be a few stepping through code and showing you how to actually implement these things. Um, so let's go get on with it. So here's me doing the side eye. Um, I have been a developer advocate for uh, two years at AWS and a software developer for 20. Yes, I am that old, but I can still get away with a pink unicorn. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, and um, I've been building cloud native applications uh, for quite a while, actually, uh, seven or eight years. And for the last four, actually nearly five years, I've been working at AWS. You may detect a slight accent. I'm not originally from Australia, I'm from Ireland, and that's why I have my green connies. Just uh, a little nod back to the home country. Originally from Belfast, um, now living in Perth in Western Australia. So as this is a DevOps conference, I'm gonna start with a graph. Um, so as we can see, and what we accept in modern software development is as the length between releases increases, the pain of our users increases too. Why is that? Because quite frankly, a user using your software who has a bug in it for three months is gonna stop using your software. And so it's within your own best interest as the owner of, of that software to release, reduce that uh, frequency of, sorry, increase that frequency of release and reduce the time between releases because it'll make your, your users happy, contented, and um, use your software for a longer period of time. How do we do that? How do we reduce the time between releases? Well, as a community, as a software development community, we've adopted automation. We automate everything. We automate all the stages within um, our build and deployment pipeline. Now, automation itself brings its own challenges because there's a lot to automate. If we want to go by the automate everything mantra, we have to think about a lot of things that we need to automate. We need to automate merging of code. We need to make sure that that code merge has not broken anything. So we need tests and we need linting of the code. We also need a way to automate, obviously, the build and compilation cycles of our code. And we also need a way to automate our uh, infrastructure. So we build our infrastructure in code and automate its deployment. Then we also need to think about, well, how do we run compliance checks? We need to automate those. We need to make what we're building as secure as possible. And we need to put that security compliance check as early in the pipeline as possible. And then last, but certainly not least, we need to automate the deployment. We need to get that final deployment happening more often, as consistently as possible, and as fast as possible, automating everything. That's a lot. And what it actually brings is a lot of this. Choices. No one tool is gonna to do all of that. A tool might, but it's not gonna be the best of breed. It's not gonna be 100% fitting the requirements of your application. So you need choice. And with those choices, you need to decide, well, what is the best orchestration tool? What is the best uh, container registry? What is the best security compliance checks that I can run so that I can reduce their, um, my release, I can increase my release cadence, but also um, increase the quality of my software. So today, I'm gonna to show you some of those choices that you can actually take. I'm gonna actually build a Flask app, so in Python, and I'm gonna run it in a container. 
I'm going to deploy that container on the AWS cloud because I'm going to uh, automate that deployment and I'm going to orchestrate that pipeline using GitHub Actions and explain why later. And then at the end, I'm going to show you why flexibility is key because when we start this process of building our beautiful app, the things that we know at the start are completely different to the things that we actually are experiencing at the end. So flexibility is key. So let's start with a bit of a level set. Let's meet some services. So for those, someone who hasn't used AWS before, I'm going to describe the services that I'm going to use when building, deploying this Flask app. The first thing I'm going to use is a container registry. So Amazon ECR is our container registry. Why do we need container registries? Well, it's to store our containers and version them. And we can do things like security compliance checks on those containers while they're in the registry. So what we're going to do is use Amazon ECR to store the container that contains our Flask app. Next, we need somewhere to deploy that container. We need a container runtime. So what we're going to do is use AWS Fargate. So if you've never used AWS before, there's two options, two options if you want to run containers. There's EKS to run your Kubernetes and ECS to run containers that are not Kubernetes. Fargate sits on top of both of those. So what Fargate does, it abstracts away the underlying infrastructure uh, of where your containers are running on. So you think of it as a serverless uh, way and runtime and orchestrator of those containers. So with Fargate, you just have to specify the memory that you want your containers to use and the size of CPU. <coughs> Next, like anything, we need to deploy and define this infrastructure. So I'm going to use a mechanism called the AWS CDK, which is how we can define that infrastructure that we're provisioning as code. So why do I want to provision my infrastructure as code? Well, obviously, obviously the code is not YAML or JSON because tabs are hard, brackets are hard. I just don't want to write infrastructure as code in JSON or YAML when I can write it in the programming language that I like. So that's why uh, I'd use the AWS CDK. So I can add stuff like loops, uh, inheritance, conditionals, easy access and injection of parameters, and I can actually run unit tests on my infrastructure as code, which is awesome. And then finally, um, the orchestration of my build and deployment pipeline, I'm going to use GitHub Actions. So GitHub Actions is a way you can orchestrate um, build and deployment of code that sits on GitHub. Now, I work a lot with open source uh, developers who use GitHub uh, and GitHub Actions. And I, when, with working with them and, and, and starting to implement things with GitHub Actions, I've grown to see how flexible uh, and easy it is to get started on GitHub Actions, but also some complex things you can actually do that you may not be aware of. And hence, this is this talk. Why would you want to use GitHub Actions? So I've got three different types of GitHub Actions here that I'm going to use today. And this outlines the flexibility of the platform. GitHub Actions is a series of actions that you can get from GitHub, so published on the GitHub Actions website. You can also leverage actions from, uh, in the GitHub Actions website from AWS. Uh, so today I'm going to use uh, credentials, uh, configure AWS credentials, among other actions that I'm going to use to um, satisfy the requirements of deploying this Flask app. But also I can run scripts that I build myself. So everybody has their little snowflake of an application that has a custom script that you need to uh, run sometimes. Uh, and so GitHub Actions will support that. So the key uh, and the takeaway from GitHub Actions is its flexibility. So let's start by looking at the application that I'm going to build today. So here I've got the application um, set up in two packages. I've got the application itself, so the Flask app, and the um, CDK infrastructure as code. 
So if I look into it, you'll see app.py is a Flask app, and all it does in its right is return a random string. A very simple app, but proving a process. I've also got a test. So the test for my app in, inserts a, a string and then asserts that the string is actually returned backwards. So my application is fit for purpose. Like any good test, what it should do. So as well as that, because we're practicing in Docker, Docker, uh, I've got a Docker file which defines my app and how I want to package it so that I can deploy it to ECR. And that includes the requirements. So it just needs Flask, which is pretty, pretty simple in terms of requirements text. Uh, it exposes the port and the program that it needs to run, which is app.py. Here is a task definition. So a task definition is a wrapper for a Fargate task. In here, I define how much memory and CPU I want Fargate to consume to run my application. So no thing, nothing about EC2 or anything like that. Fargate is abstracting that uh, away from me. And all, all I have to define is uh, memory and CPU. That's the app. The other thing I want to highlight is the infrastructure's code, so using the CDK. So the entry point to this uh, CDK, which is written in Python, you can use .NET, C Sharp, C -sharp uh, Java, uh, TypeScript, is you define an app, and inside an app is a stack. Inside the stack, I've got an ECR repository, which I talked about earlier. I've got uh, so a VPC to house my infrastructure. I then define the ECS cluster and a role. So the role is so I, my ECS cluster, Fargate, can grab the, um, the image from ECR. I then inject the task definition that I showed you earlier and uh, define the Fargate service. So that is basically my app. It's got the application, the Flask app, and the CDK. So I'm deploying the CDK manually, CDK deploy. So how the CDK works, it actually generates CloudFormation. So CloudFormation in the AWS console, I show you now, I can verify that the CDK code uh, has been provisioned and all the resources that I expect to be there are actually there and they are provisioned and they're working. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm just clicking through and just making sure everything is good. If I then move over to the Fargate service itself, you can see that there is my ECS DevOps sandbox cluster all there provisioned, ready and waiting for something. So that is uh, the code and how to provision it using the CDK. The first thing I need to do is automate. So some of you may be thinking, well, I could, we could probably automate uh, both things here. We can automate the app, and we can automate the CDK infrastructure's code as well. Absolutely right, 100%. For this talk, I'm just going to concentrate on the app itself and not bother with the CDK infrastructure's code. I just want to uh, remain laser focused on deploying the app. So we'll do that next. The app um, I'm going to do, it's going to go like this. Git push, risen an event in GitHub, in, instantiates a uh, GitHub action, runs a test. If the test is successful, we've seen the test, then it goes along the rest of the, the workflow, does the deploy job step, which uh, deploys to ECR, and then finally um, deploys it all to Fargate. Sounds good. Let's get started. So um, here we are in GitHub. So this is my GitHub repo uh, for GitHub Actions. The first thing I need to do is uh, go into the Actions. So it's just a tab inside my uh, GitHub uh, repository. So with GitHub Actions, you can actually choose workflows that are from the marketplace. So I'm going to pull down two here that I'm going to use. So one is Python, because this is a Python app. So if I configure, hit configure, it'll give me an example that I can actually use. So I can use this out of the box, and it'll, it'll, um, it'll push it to GitHub for me and inside my code repository. Uh, it, and it will show me all the steps and all the tasks I need to do to actually build and deploy a Python application. It's pretty handy, pretty easy to use. It's all there. It also shows me the parameters that I need to use. So that's how you deploy a Flask app. As well as that, I'll also show you a second action, which is how to deploy uh, to ECS. So this is an action written by AWS. All these actions are open source and on the GitHub Marketplace. So if I search for deploy to Amazon ECS, I find it and hit configure, it'll show me an example with lovely steps on how to deploy something to ECS with a GitHub action. 
including the parameters I'll need, like the region, uh, the repository URL, uh, the ser ECS service I'm going to, etc., uh, etc., et plus all of the steps that are involved um, from build, deploy, uh, and test. So if you notice, AWS dash X actions before all of these um, tasks, it's pulling in other um, actions that are actually published on the um, uh, GitHub Actions marketplace. So nothing, this is code you don't have to write. Again, into security. So what we need to do is actually secure the, the, um, the connection between uh, GitHub and AWS. And you do that by um, defining the AWS access key and secret key. Uh, you can do, you don't have to do one, you can do multiple, and then adding new ones is just easy. Uh, clicking that new uh, repository secret, and then you can connect into different accounts uh, with different privileges. So I'm gonna actually build it from scratch. So in here, we've got my code, and I'm gonna create a .github uh, folder slash workflows. So that will be picked up by GitHub Actions when I push to GitHub. So I'm gonna call this action test-deploy.yaml. It's in YAML, yep. And the first thing I need to do is give it a name and say when do I want this action to initiate. So I want this action to initiate on a push on the branch, on the main branch. So that um, uh, will initiate. What permissions do I need to give the action? Is a read permission. Um, and I'm, you may notice that I, I'm copying and pasting this for the most part from those examples I showed you earlier. So, because I don't want to know how to um, deploy a Python, build a Python. I can get someone else to tell me. Um, so I'm pulling that in, pulling in the action. So we've got action slash checkout, which is a GitHub action uh, that GitHub have already uh, published. I set the Python version. I set the commands that you need to run. So that's a script. Um, and I run PyTest. Because remember, this is the flow. So I'm running uh, on, on check-in. I am checking th things out and running PyTest to test to run my uh, unit test. Once I've defined that step, um, I need to define the deploy to ECS step. So that's next. So I'm pulling in the parameters that I need, again, from that example that I showed you earlier, but I'm actually filling them out with concrete uh, parameters. So once I've defined those parameters, including the task definition.json, I can then start building out that workflow. Again, I go to the example that I got from GitHub, and I paste it in, and I just uh, change a few things, including the needs. So I'm, this is a dependent action, a uh, dependent task that I'm using test uh, as a dependent. So if test does not pass or complete, then it will not run deploy. Again, showing you that some of these actions are uh, uh, published by GitHub, and some of them are uh, created by AWS, including the, the good old configure AWS credentials that I showed you in the earlier slide, which pulls in the access key and the secret key and the region that I need to connect GitHub Actions to AWS. I then go through all of the steps. So this is how I build and tag my container. So I'm using the GitHub SHA uh, hash to actually uh, version my container so that every commit creates a, a, um, a new version uh, version of the container that I know I can then trace back uh, from the deployment to the actual uh, commit history. Next, uh, using that commit ID, I pass in the task definition and the con container name that I need uh, ECR to use, and then finally pull that um, container from ECR into ECS. And then if you notice at the bottom, once that's deployed in the cluster that I define, I wait to see the service is stable before finishing uh, the workflow. So that, that is basically um, the uh, concrete example for the workflow. Once I push my code up to GitHub, you can see the action running. So test was really quick, quick because it's a simple Python task. But then when I drill into it, I can see individual tasks and actions uh, into it. So I can look into how far deploy is coming on. At the minute, it's a spinny wheel. If I click into it, you can see that it currently it's deploying, waiting for ECR uh, to be ECS to be ready, and then it, when that's ready, it will finish eventually the uh, the deployment. And I could drill in and see any details, anything went wrong, if it indeed goes wrong uh, during the deployment. And then it, what's also handy is this little UI, which is uh, lightweight and and quite easy to to read. So my 
container has uh, successfully been built, tests have been run against it, and it's been deployed. Happy days. That's good, but um, that's not reality <laughs> because projects change, requirements change, everything everything changes. Uh, uh, good, good title for a song. Um, so what if um, our product owner or our architect, um, usually um, enterprise architect, decides that, well, uh, tests, we don't want our tests to run on, on GitHub Action. There may be um, security constraints there. Uh, we don't want that test to run on GitHub. We want to run it in AWS, so our own env AWS environment to reduce uh, I don't know, security blast radius. S that's good. We say we can use and change our uh, GitHub Action to actually change any of those individual tasks that we've built to run inside AWS. And we use that using AWS Code Build. So if you don't know Code Build, it's a service that runs inside AWS that actually is a container that will build uh, artifacts for you uh, and enable you to do that inside the AWS account of choice. So if you want to create a task that runs in, uh, inside AWS and you want to run, do not want to run your tests inside GitHub, or you want to reduce the security blast radius to inside AWS, and you also want to satisfy that flexibility that happens, then AWS Code Build is a good way of integrating GitHub Actions um, and AWS together. And you do it like this. So again, you, your code sits on um, GitHub. When you push to GitHub, it will actually have a code build agent listening for that push. And when it gets the notification, code build will do its thing. So in our example, I'm going to run the tests in code build. But it doesn't have to be tests. It could be anything. Once the tests are, are passing, code build will notify using GitHub actions using this, the GitHub status API. The GitHub status API will then allow our um, workflow to complete. And you do that like this. So here we are in, in code build. So I can create a um, code build project. I'm doing this in the console, rather, but you do that in uh, CDK if you could, in infrastructure as code. But I'm showing you a console because I haven't spent any time in the AWS console, and we love it so much. So we call this uh, project uh, ECS DevOps Sandbox. Give it a name. Give it a description if you want. Then once you've given a description, you need to um, connect to a source provider. If you notice, uh, it supports a lot of source providers. Um, but I'm going to um, connect it up to my GitHub repo that's housing my GitHub action. I can secure it either using a, a PAT or I can actually do SSO as well, but I'm using a PAT, uh, private access token. Uh, and then uh, I can then check this box to notify the code when things happen, and that's key. And that's why I want to update the, the GitHub status API. With code build, I define the container that the build is actually going to run in. So we run running this in Ubuntu, and define a location of a build spec file. So a build spec file is something that lives in your code base and defines the actual build, what the build is going to do. So for this build, I'm going to do Python, and I'm going to Python app test, so run my tests. It's that simple. So once I've defined that, I then need to go back into my action and make a few changes. So I still have the parameters. Same parameters, I give an additional status. So we want least, least privileges only, so status of read the API. I then define this task. So what this task does, it periodically uh, checks the GitHub status uh, in the API. And if the status is successful, it will um, let the build continue. If it's uh, pending or failed, pending will try again. Failed will fail the build. So we will we'll not get to uh, build and deploy. So once I push it up to GitHub, um, you'll see, and this is a, the build uh, code build running, you will see the code build is executed, and you can actually drill into what it actually did uh, inside the logs. And you can see if this is a more complex task than just running a single uh, unit test, then you can drill into it and see uh, for ours, we were just uh, running app test.py. It was a success. Hooray. Uh, and then you can go back into um, code build, 
sorry, GitHub, choose a repository, uh, and choose the action that you're building. If you then jump into it, you can then check its status. So here's my deploy status. It is finished, but I can check how many times it actually pulled uh, GitHub status API to check the status. So I can actually find out if, if that was taking too long or how long it was actually taking and give me more uh, insights and observability into my actual build process. That is all fine. And then as you, see, as you can see, all my steps completed, same steps. Um, the rest of the steps are exactly the same as the previous example when I was using GitHub Actions just uh, to do the tests. So that's how you use uh, code build and the GitHub status API to um, change things and keep things flexible. So what I want you to take away from this talk today is automation is still everything. Um, we want to automate as much as we can. Uh, it will, some of it, we need to make business decisions, of course, because it costs, it costs money to automate things, but we need to um, marry that off and um, put that against uh, the business value that it's actually adding. Embrace choices and challenges. Um, I, I, get, I talk to developers a lot, and sometimes they come to me and go, Derek, AWS has too many services, or there's too many ways to do this. And I say to them, would you rather only have one way? Would it be the best way? Probably not, because nobody, nobody has the best way to do things. Uh, the key is understanding the choices, uh, understanding the different choices and their impact and the benefits that they can give. Today I've showed you how you can use AWS and GitHub Actions to solve these challenges and the flexibility challenge. But don't ever assume there's only one way to skin a cat. Uh, always look at options, depending on time, depending on budget, but always be aware. Never silo yourself uh, in a single, single way of doing things, because things change. And the best way to learn new things, and the best way that I always use, is to build. Have a try. Everybody has a, an R in their day. You can go play with stuff. We're all techies. We all enjoy playing with new things. This is a great excuse, so go build. If anybody has any questions about uh, my talk today, I can go into a lot more depth about any of the services that I talked uh, today about. I'll be over there in the AWS booth for the rest of the day. Come chat to me, come ask me questions, and uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>